Global quantum intelligence. So there's a clue in the name. Global, we cover the sector globally. Quantum, we cover all things quantum. And intelligence, well, hopefully our clients uh, think our products are intelligent. Quantum tech sector of a wide impact. And uh, hopefully you've, you've heard us speak before uh, about uh, quantum computing, quantum simulation, uh, the opportunities and challenges of, of getting value from these, these sectors, separate occasions about quantum safe cryptography, about quantum communications. And today I want to talk about quantum sensing wide impacts in its own right. I want to give you a sense of the work we've been doing in this area and how we think about the opportunity in this sector. Uh, so, so, for, so first of all, some, some basics. And, and you might think, why is he putting up basic stuff, like superposition, entanglement? But I want, to, I want to draw out that there's some interesting points here to keep in mind when you think about the sector. Now, Paul in Inflection did a great job earlier, I hope you caught it, of introducing some of the basic points here about how superposition gives us access to interferometry and matter interferometry, which is an entanglement brings new opportunities on top of that. But, but there's some other things to point out here as well. I mean, interferometry, it's a real power word for a physicist. Our most exquisite sensing technologies have been based on optical interferometry since before quantum mechanics was conceived. So some of the technologies that we're facing in conventional sensors, they, they already leverage that optical interferometer. It's one of the reasons why they're, they're fierce competitors. And often we're faced with uh, a new technology at the beginning of its life cycle, coming in and facing off with very mature established technology that performs very well, thank you very much. But I wanted to, to bring out, there's another point here which actually is a, is, a, is a key USP for some of the sensing technology actually getting into market at the moment, which is when I measure with a quantum system, I, I, I can reference it back to that fundamental measure. I can often have the device calibrate itself rather than have to be calibrated externally. And that, that ability to give a good performance but with no drift well, that's, that's a secret USP that we have to keep in mind that many current sensors are, are getting advantage from as they fight their way into the market. Uh, so there's been an explosion of jargon. There's lots of projects, different, different variations of platform. It, it has its own jargon. Uh, and so what have we been doing to, to bring some, some, some sense into how we analyze and think about the sector? Uh, we put together a stack, and hopefully you've seen uh, our, our quantum computing stack for hardware, for a mid stack, for quantum uh, top of the stack software, uh, or for, for quantum cryptography. Uh, this is the stack we put together for, for quantum sensing. Now, let me take you through, obviously, at the bottom, the, the physics package. And often it is right to think about a sensing qubit. That's often a good model to understand these devices. But then a control package, and yes, Often it's about getting out of the lab into a, a, a swap, a size, weight, and power package, which is deployable in the chosen application with the right engineering severity level that lets you, lets you get in the environment you need to sense in. Often space has a particular role to play. In the wider dispensing market, becoming space qualified is a, a traditional badge of honor. If you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. It was, uh, it was, it was interesting to see Northrop Grumman yesterday banging their chest about the James uh, uh, Webb Space Telescope, and, and quite rightly so. Move up and, and of course, control logic. And, and here, some of the, the, the protocols we find are, are not, they're related to the protocols you use to control qubits in, in quantum computing. And indeed, some of the error suppression techniques uh, come across very analogously, and we'll see how that has an impact on strategies in the sector. Take it up, and of course, we need a framework to manage the overall calibration, the infrastructure to, to let us read out these devices, and the basic application is the modality itself. Is it sensing time, magnetic field, electric field, gravity, acceleration? Uh, but of course, then there's other advanced applications on top. So let me, let me show you what we've done with this stack and, and how, we've, how we've validated and how we're getting, getting use out of it. Uh, this, is, this is the piece of work we've done stacking up different sensing projects against the stack. And you'll see there's a lot of them. And, and this, isn't, this isn't individual projects. This is actually configurations. And you'll see multiple names often at the top of, of a lot of these stacks. We've also forced ourselves to look at what we think is the, the, the most appropriate competing conventional technology in each of the, in each of the segments. 
Uh, and obviously, you, you encourage you to buy our report so you can go through this in detail. Uh, but let me present some summary thoughts here. Um, this is, this is us summarizing that, that picture up. And of course, one of the, one of the things that stands out uh, to start with here is that the main, the main platforms that one can use, well, they're heavily reminiscent of the, the main quantum computing platforms, superconducting circuits, NV diamonds, uh, MOTs, RF traps, photonics, et cetera. Uh, and that, that, that's got some important implications. Because particularly when I, if I'm a government thinking about how I can stimulate my overall quantum ecosystem, I want, to get, I want to get the value from lots of applications, but I also want to stimulate the supply chain, the ecosystem. And acting across quantum computing, quantum communications, and quantum sensing can often be helping the same component suppliers and the same companies that are able to play in multiple parts of the discipline. The other thing about the stack is you'll see a lot of software, and I'll come back to the implication of that later, and you'll see some of these emerging high-level applications at the top, position, navigation, and timing, detection and ranging, surface, uh, subsurface imaging. And Mike, in his, his presentation from AFRL, did a great job of giving you a taste uh, of, of what some of these applications uh, you know, mean in practice. And, and of course, one of the things that immediately springs off at looking at these applications, so many of them are dual use. Defense security applications as well as potential applications in the civilian sector. And that has implications for the, the strategies that both governments and, uh, and uh, uh, commercial companies want to pursue to exploit this technology. Now, I wanted to say a word about clocks in particular, and clocks are important. You may have, if you've been at QTB before, you may have bumped into some of the NIST guys in the bar, you know, mumbling over their pints that clocks are really important, but clocks are really important. And I just wanted to drill this point out because things have changed in the world of metrology since a lot of us will have been at college, and you may have missed this. The way we define units is not in terms of artifacts buried somewhere in Paris anymore that changed, and instead now the, the, the game plan is you, you basically take a physical constant that you take as some fixed value, you combine that with a frequency measure, a time measure, and that lets you, that lets you define your unit, and that matters. Because if I'm trying to create a device that's gonna be referencing one of any of these sets of all of the, the key unit types, then actually to give it that self-calibrating ability, I'm ultimately going to need a clock in the mix somewhere. That's why an initiative like NIST on a chip is so interesting. It builds on you know, the, you know, the success NIST's had in the past of taking atomic clocks onto, onto chips and says, well, look, can we put the technology to do uh, other types of unit measure onto this deployable type of platform as well? Clocks, and, and you look across what's happening in clocks and, and you know, there's this distinction between the, the package size. I've got applications where, where I really want an embedded clock. I've got applications where a, a larger fieldable clock will, will suit. So if I, if I want a clock for my new aircraft carrier, it doesn't have to go on the captain's wrist. There's more space to play with. If I want a clock for my premium major strategic radar installation, I've got more budget and more place, space to fill with this too. And the technology on clocks has, has got an interesting disruptive element at the moment. Traditionally, we, we've, we've done a lot with microwave clocks, and the microwave refers to the tick speed of the clock. And the coming technology for some time has been optical clocks, faster tick, more accurate, but they've been larger form factor. Now, one of the interesting breakthrough results in this sector uh, is one that, that Mike uh, referred to, the ORAF's uh, technology that's been developed through uh, support for AFRL. Um, and what we've got there is an optical clock, but that can be realized in a vapor cell platform. And that potentially makes it much more compactable. So interesting disruptive element to what we could do with that type of technology. And of course, one of the things you can do with clocks is position, navigation, and timing. Now, you, you may have come across this area. It's been very topical. And you, you'll, you must in the, in the press, articles about this quantum initiative that's doing something about you know, disrupted GPS. And uh, one of the things that I think I wanted to emphasize in the context of this slide is this is a large area with multiple threads of endeavor going on. If I'm, if I'm worried about assured PNT, if my GPS gets disrupted, then sometimes all I need is, is, is better time signal holdover until I can get the signal again after that's clocked. Sometimes 
it's actually, and there's an extensive effort already to harden our GPS GNSS systems. And sometimes that's better clocks again. Sometimes it's encryption. That's an interesting quantum uh, aspect of there as well. Um, but then also, there are alternatives, such as map-based solutions. It can be a terrain-following solution. I can follow the map if, I, if I'm not getting my GPS. And new options there, for example, gravity maps enabled by quantum sensing or magnetic maps enabled by quantum sensing. Or indeed, some of that same gravity slash acceleration technology used for new inertial navigation units to sense acceleration. And, and the reason for emphasizing this is just to encourage us to keep in mind when we hear about a particular quantum impact for PNT to remember that there's actually a whole host of things going on in parallel. It's why it's such a rich and dynamic sector for the, the quantum industry. Detection and ranging. Now, radio waves, microwave waves, you know, at radar detection and ranging. Uh, radio detection and ranging. Radar has been our go-to uh, detection technology through the electronics age. More recently, light detection and ranging. LIDAR has been the go-to technology uh, in the photonic uh, range. And they're established technologies. And what, what I've done here is a good physicist. I've drawn out the electromagnetic spectrum that ultimately unifies all of this stuff, really. And the thing that I think is, is, is really exciting and interesting to see is how you've got quantum impacts right the way across this spectrum, different things going on. But it's remarkable how many of these different uh, you know, bands that you can actually say there's something interesting happening with quantum sensing. You know, sometimes it's about a development of uh, single photon technology, time correlated photon uh, counting in, say, shortwave infrared, and it's giving us new options in you know, tactical imaging, but also new options in gas sensing. Come back to some of the examples of strategies around that, that later. Then, Rydberg atoms um, gives us a new way of sensing. Uh, uh, sensing uh, electromagnetic waves, radio waves, across a surprisingly wide range of the, the spectrum, giving us new options for compact, tunable sensors that can do things it's very difficult to do with a conventionally designed antenna. But also then subsurface imaging, using very long wavelengths to image below the waves of the sea, below the, the surface of the Earth. And of course, that's just one of the quantum techniques we can use for subsurface imaging, because there's also using straightforward magnetic detection, straightforward gravity detection because of the nature of the new uh, gravity uh, devices. Now, of course, one of the things that is you know, apparent when you talk about these, you know, these applications we've been talking about so far is they are very dual use. And of course, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. We, we need to support uh, uh, the defense of our nations. But when a government tackles this area, they, well, they also want to see are we exploiting other economic opportunities that, that, that can be tackled with this technology. And they may very well be looking for missions that it's easier to sell to the populace and, and the voter about why they should support investment in this technology. That's why some of the other areas are very pertinent here as well. If I can get it to move on. Oh, my clicker has failed. Bad sensor. Ah, here we go. So medical diagnostics. Now, this is the pharmaceutical value chain, the healthcare value chain. And of course, this is, we, all, we, we talk about quantum computing impacts here already. But there's also a lot of sensing impacts. I mean, there's also a lot of quantum sensors already used here, really. MRI is a type of quantum sensor. Uh, Squid-based MEG has pioneered a new type of, of brain scanning. But there's new quantum sensors now further extending this market. And I'm not just thinking of uh, NV diamond-based microscopes from the likes of Konami and Kuzabra, actually available to purchase for R&D purposes now, or indeed OPM MEG, which is extending that, that uh, promises to extend that brain scanning market that was started by that other quantum sensor. Sustainability, here you take the, the resources value chain, the energy value chain, agriculture value chain, let me just add some detail to that, and then add on the quantum impacts. And again, of course, one can talk about quantum computing impacts here, but one can very much talk about potential quantum sensing impacts, whether it is detecting greenhouse gases, whether it's being able to detect damage to soils by, by understanding the soil 
um, density better, a, a variety of different, different ones. And again, what that should help us keep in mind is that commercial and government strategies around this area are being driven by the opportunity to have, to have missions in this, this area. And, and that's why it should be no surprise. This is, these are the, the five missions that have just been launched in the UK. Uh, five quantum missions just launched in the UK as it goes out of the first 10 years of its quantum program into the second 10 years. And look, of the five missions, three of them are sensor related. Very interesting, actually, mission five pushes into a, a, a very interesting and challenging domain of what might we be able to do with networked quantum sensors, where we're beginning to, uh, one, one, you know, one's uh, seen you know, theoretical results about uh, what this, this might enable in terms of additionally pushing out uh, the, the possibilities with sensing. It's very interesting to see uh, money and momentum being committed by a big program to that type of initiative. And so what do we see in terms of commercial player strategies as they position themselves in this, this market? So for some, and this is, these are generic ones we've, we've picked out as illustratives of the different ways people position themselves, because it's, it's, it's quite contrasting across the sector. So for example, for some applications, you really do have to be the, the full stack guy that's just going to do it. So QLM with their gas sensors for methane detection, yes, they developed the, the technology to do the sensing. Yes, they packaged it into a camera. Yes, they've toured around and taken it to the test rigs around the world that's necessary to convince the oil and gas sector that this really works. For other opportunities, it's interesting to see how players have been able to really position themselves as key enabling component suppliers inside the ecosystem. So for example, I think Inflection have been a great example of this. You've seen how they've used working with an ecosystem to provide necessary, it might be a cold atom source that they've provided, worked with an ecosystem and government funding to help create that ecosystem benefits, but the company benefits very well as well. They've put their their device in the, in the space station, and, and again, they're helping multiple ecosystems develop, and it's helping develop their business. Of course, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of software here really in sensing as well. It's really interesting to see companies, companies like Quantum Control, that have developed their technology for you know, error suppression uh, in the quantum computing domain, and now actively bringing that across into quantum sensing, and it gives them of access to other funding opportunities, other markets, uh, with that leverage of that same technology. And then at the top of that, that, that software stack, there's a lot of software in packaging this stuff together. And it's, it's emergent techniques such as sensor fusion, uh, such as computational imaging, such as uh, machine learning enabled decision support. And so it's no surprise to see a player like Sandbox AQ leveraging the software skills it wants to, it has and wants to create, build it anyway, and turning them into sensor products. And, and sometimes you need a, a champion to really pull something together. So circumagnetics that have led the charge into OPM MEG for uh, brain scanning app, medical brain scanning applications, they don't make the sensors, it's Q-spin do that. But they've packaged it into a helmet, and particularly, they've driven it through the clinical trials process, and they've driven it into clinical situations uh, where the, the technology can prove itself. And of course, large uh, defense uh, integrators uh, have a particular role to play in this market. And I, I, I mentioned Thales here, just to remind the audience that there are defense integrators other than American-based ones. Uh, and it's obviously going to be a key part of this, this market. So that's, uh, that's the thoughts I wanted to share with you. And I'd obviously encourage you to engage further with the, the detail of the, the Global Quantum Intelligence product if, you, if this interests you and you want to find out more. Thank you.